thinking, assuming, or believing you know what will happen next creates an unrealistic expectation in a, in a specific outcome. Mark's point here is that we don't know when a trade is going to work, and consistent profitability happens through the cumulative results of our trades. The accumulated, you, the accumulated, the accumulated. He's continuing to reinforce the point of having a wider perspective. We don't know which trades will work, but to a certain degree, we can assume the overall results of a hundred trades. That's why we need to lower the emphasis on individual trade results. Your ability to create consistent results as a trader is all about what you expect. When you change your expectations to be consistent with the way the environment, the market environment exists, the fear will go away. Unrealistic expectations cause us to define and interpret and therefore perceive market information as threatening. There are many reasons that price action is interpreted as a threat by our brain, resulting in a physiological response that can cause poor judgment and maladaptive behavior. I like Mark's idea here about it being caused by unrealistic expectations. However, even the recognition that we don't know what will happen next isn't really a solution. Me knowing that spiders scare me doesn't make me not scared of spiders. Knowing that I don't know what will happen next in the market doesn't give me comfort. However, this applies very well to people with big egos. If you think you know what will happen next and have unrealistic expectations, then part of the market being perceived as a threat will be due to its potential to go against your grandiose beliefs about yourself. In other words, something happening that goes against your belief is a threat to who you are. If you think it's going to go up, and it goes down, suddenly you think the market is questioning your intelligence on a subconscious or conscious level. This causes cognitive dissonance, but I already talked about that in my video called The Psychology of Staying and Losing Trades. At first I was like, what is this guy drawing? Then I realized it's just a pen and a pair of glasses sitting on a notebook. Curse you, 240p. Because if I start gathering evidence as to why it might not work, then I might talk myself out of taking the trade. And then if I end up talking myself out of taking the trade and it turns out to be a winner, I'll probably be in more emotional pain than what I would have been in had I taken the trade and it turned out to be a loser. And then the last stage is the intuitive. This is the most advanced mode of trading. It would be the equivalent to getting a black belt in martial arts. It's when you find yourself in the zone, tapped into the collective consciousness of the market, giving you a sense of the flow. If you look at the market as being, you know, a collection of individuals, you can tap into that, you can find yourself. It's not something you can will yourself into. This is when I think of people like Day Trader Next Door. Incredible at trading futures, but he can't really teach you and I a system for trading. He has so much experience that his intuition tells him when to get in and when to get out. You can't teach someone something like that. He has learned the language of trading, and he speaks it fluently. It's a part of him but it's not really something that can be communicated to someone new. If that was the case, then he would have just coded his trading system to do it automatically for him a long time ago. Everyone has intuitive capabilities, there are, but, but some people it's completely shut off, and with others, you know, they don't trust it because, you know, they, 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 don't, they can't make the distinction between what's intuition and what's just their mind hoping that something's going to happen or hoping that, you know, what they see is, is, is really what's going on and making it feel like intuition. This one's extremely important. There's a big difference between intuition and what we hope will happen. At this point in me moving over to futures, I recognize I don't have any intuition for it. It will be a long time before that happens. The problem is, until you acquire these fundamental skills that we're talking about, you definitely don't want to be trading based on intuitive impulses. You just want to make note of them. When you've got the skills, then find yourself in the zone, then go ahead and do whatever, whatever comes to your brain until you've flipped yourself out of it, meaning when you start thinking at a rational level, you mostly just, you flip yourself right out, of the, right out of the zone. In this section, we're going to discuss how prices move and who the players are behind it. When you understand how traders make prices move, then how you need to think to generate consistent results will start to become clear to you. I'll just summarize what he said. Obviously, the market is a lot different now from when this was made, but you already know that price goes up when sell orders are taken out, and price goes down when buy orders are taken out. 
Basically, it's all about imbalances and the amount of orders at different levels. Price moves because of imbalances between buy and sell orders. Don't overcomplicate it. I'm 30 minutes into part 3 and he's still talking about this, so here's a summary. He's talking about how institutional traders are the ones that actually move the price. However, nowadays, retail traders are actually a good chunk of price movement. Of course, we're not the ones who make those gigantic candles where there is clearly a huge entry or exit confirmed by volume that shows an imbalance. But institutional traders and investors are not responsible for every movement. He's talking about how we need to get into the minds of those big traders to try and follow them. The world we are in is no longer 99% institutional. Retail traders are now about 10% of trading volume, which sounds low, but keep in mind that many of us are trading all day whereas institutional involvement may only be a couple, of presi pres <laughs> a couple of positions per day. We are the noise of the market, and they are the ones making the big candles. That's simplified, but I think you get it. We are in a different world than when this workshop was done, but it's still just people making price move, and understanding people and institutions is still important. We're going to take what we now understand about the nature of price movement and look at the nature of technical analysis to see, just see what we got here, okay? <laughs> see how well it, you know, it meshes. I just want you to understand that when you understand what's going on, you will, will be able to trade your plan because you won't be putting so much emphasis on things that don't have any relevance. Like expecting this next trade to work just because you got a signal. You can, you can always break it down to one fundamental reason. The only, fun, the only reason that, that really there is. It was an imbalance mm -hmm. between, between buyers and sellers. Price movement is always the result of an imbalance. Because when there's balance, there's no movement. Right. It's that simple. Right. If there's balance, there's no movement. Prices do not move when there's balance. I'll do the analogy to technical analysis to uh, flipping a coin. Okay, that if you, if you take an evenly weighted coin and flip it a thousand times, you've got a large sample size there, right? The pattern that will emerge with each thousand flip sample size is a relatively even distribution between heads and tails. Maybe not quite 50-50, but let's say 49.2 and, you know, uh, 49.8 or something, whatever. There might be a little bit of variance, more variance there. But in any case, that will be a pattern. See, that's a pattern. Because it'll happen every single time you flip the coin a thousand times. But within that thousand flip sample size, is there any way, since you're going to get an even distribution between heads and tails, is there any way that you can know for sure which individual flip is going to be heads and which individual flip is going to be tails? No. You could get 10 flips of heads in a row and be absolutely positive the next one's going to be tails, and it could come up heads again. And even though you can have all these streaks of heads and tails, in the end, it's still going to come up 50-50. This is exactly the way technical analysis works, exactly. When you consider the diversity, the diversity of the market with all the different players and all the different agendas from people all over the world trying to predict what will happen next would be almost equivalent to sitting in front of a slot machine and coming up with some rational reason why you think that the, the pattern that you're looking for is going to come up on the next push of the button. This might be my favorite clip. It's easy to say vague things about what we need to do, but Mark does an amazing job at giving us an example of how to think in probabilities. He is saying that we don't need to know what's going to happen next. We don't need to be able to rationally explain our position. I'm not going to pretend like I know what's going to happen. The only thing I can do to be a good trader with no intuition is to have good risk management and to keep my emotions under control. Okay, I wrote that before this next clip, but I'll let Mark say it instead of me is because when we put on a trade, we put on a trade for a reason. See, reasons are important in our lives. Reasons are important. 
We put on a trade for a reason. And see, the problem is, is that when the trade works, we think our re we just naturally think our reason was right. What I'm trying to do here is help you disconnect, is disconnect any reason that you put on a trade with the reason why it actually moved. Because like I said before, there's almost never a relationship. There's almost never a correlation. And so the next time that reason seems to appear in the market, we're going we're gonna to do the same thing, thinking we'll get the same result. And then when we don't, we feel betrayed. And then the next time the reason comes up, we're going to be a little hesitant. And we might not put it on at all. We'll try to find additional reasons why this trade will work. When the reality is there isn't any reason you're going to be able to come up with that's going to assure you of anything. Unless the reason you're coming up with is you know the people who are actually going to bid the market up or offer it lower. And they tell you what they're going to do and why. Ultimately, there's only one reason why markets, why prices move. And what would that reason be? Come on. Imbalance in prices. Yeah, an imbalance in conviction. That's the only, and what technical analysis does is it finds patterns in that imbalance, okay? Technical analysis finds in patterns in the imbalance. If we could only take away one segment of this workshop, it should be from this clip and the one before it. That's the end of part three. There is now slightly less than two hours left of this workshop, and I will be covering it in probably a couple of weeks, but who knows. Thank you, and let me know which part of this video was the most impactful for you.